Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at Strixhaven's own culinary genius, Guillaume Master Chef. Before we continue, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. Also be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what three commanders you can vote for in the comments for an upcoming episode. With that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Guillaume Master Chef is a 5-3 troll warlock that costs 2, a black and a green, with trample and the following text. At the beginning of your end step, create a number of food tokens equal to the number of non-token creatures you had entered the battlefield under your control this turn. Additionally, we can pay 1 and sack a food to make target creature indestructible and tap it. Boasting a mid-sized cost and offensive stat line, Guillaume's abilities make it clear that, just like in his lore, he cares about food. Not only is he capable of generating food tokens, but he provides those same tokens with extra utility apart from just gaining us life, using them to protect both himself and other creatures on the board, and even using them to tap down our opponent's creatures if necessary. So the question then becomes how to use his food generation and utility he provides us with said food to help us win. A life gain strategy would be viable, as Guillaume's delicacies would be more than capable of keeping our life at a healthy amount, though I think a certain other tea connoisseur can do it better, link on screen if you're interested in learning more about that. An artifact sacrifice build could also work, playing cards that turn our food tokens into mana, card draw, or even creatures while running payoffs to punish our opponents or benefit ourselves as this is happening. But ultimately, I decided to build this deck around taking advantage of our commander's activated ability, using it to protect creatures with powerful effects that would usually die to removal. That means we'll be running plenty of creatures with big continual effects, such as making themselves or other creatures bigger and bigger as turns go by, or punishing our opponents over and over again for as long as they remain on the table, relying on Guillaume to have them stick around as long as possible. But just like any restaurant, our big clients will need a staff to serve them, so we'll be running plenty of cards that generate extra food tokens to protect them further, as well as ways to bring them back for seconds if our opponents manage to get them kicked out in the first place. Then we'll see if our opponents can handle the heat that this Iron Man chef is bringing to the table. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. The CMC1 slot starts us off with a trio of food-based creatures with Cauldron Familiar, Gilded Goose, and Ginger Brute. Cauldron Familiar is a 1-1 that drains our opponents for 1 and heals us for 1 when it ETBs, and we can sack a food to return it to the battlefield from the grave, making it a recurrable way to drain our opponents and replacing the food tokens spent to bring it back so long as our commander is out. Gilded Goose is a 0-2 flyer that creates a food when it ETBs, can tap and sack a food to generate a mana of our choice, and we can pay 1 a green and tap it to create a food, making it both a mana dork and a food generator for us. Ginger Brute is a 1-1 that counts as a food, has haste, and we can pay 1 to make it unblockable by anything without haste, or pay 2, tap it and sack it to gain 3 life, making it a food token with a body with a very interesting form of evasion we can take advantage of if we can make it bigger. Last in this slot, we're running Valentine, Dean of the Vein, a modal DFC whose front face is a 1-1 with Menace and Lifelink that has our opponents exile creatures as they die, allowing us to pay 1 when they do so to create a pest token. Its back face is Lazette, Dean of the Root, a 4-4 for 2 and double green that lets us pay 1 whenever we gain life to give all our creatures a plus 1 plus 1 counter and grant them trample until the end of the turn. While Valentine is a decent early drop to hose graveyard based strategies, Lazette is the main reason we're playing this, allowing us to grow our already hard to remove creatures and giving them trample to boot to make sure they can get in for damage. The CMC2 slot only has two members with Curious Pair and Sakura Tribelder. Curious Pair is a vanilla 1 3 that we can cast for its adventure side to create a food token for a single green, overall generating us two food as we cast it for its creature side alongside our commander for some additional food generation. Sakura Tribelder is a 1-1 we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped for some staple green ramp on a body. Moving into the CMC3 slot, we have some creatures that just keep getting bigger over time, with Mana Gorger Hydra, Marok Rigger, and Champion of Lamholt. Mana Gorger Hydra is a 1-1 with Trample that gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter anytime anyone casts a spell, quickly growing out of control unless dealt with, which our commander makes that much harder. Morok Rigger is a 2-2 that gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter anytime an artifact is sent to the grave, benefiting us as we sack our food tokens as well as when our opponent's artifacts hit the grave. Champion of Lampholt is a 1-1 that gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter anytime a creature comes into play under our control and prevents creatures with power less than it from blocking our creatures, giving us a creature that not only gets bigger itself but provides team-wide evasion as it does so. Moving deeper into this slot, we have Honor Troll, Vain Witch Coven, and Varagoth, Blood Sky Sire. Honor Troll is a 2-3 with Vigilance that gains plus 2 plus 1 if our health is over 25 and heals us for 1 additional life whenever we gain life, usually being a 4-4 if dropped early and having our food heal us for 4 as a bonus. 
Bane Witch Coven is a 3-3 with Menace that allows us to play a black whenever we gain life to return a creature from our grave to our hand, allowing us to recur creatures as we crack our food for life over and over again. Varagoth is a 2-3 Death Toucher with Boast for one in a black, which allows us to tutor any card to the top of our deck when he attacks, making him a recurrable tutor which works great alongside our commander to keep him alive as he swings in. Reaching the end of this slot, we have two food generators with Savvy Hunter and Tempting Witch. Savvy Hunter is a 3-3 that creates a food anytime it attacks or blocks, as well as allowing us to sack two food to draw a card, providing us with more food generation and a way to convert it into card advantage. Tempting Witch is a 1-3 that creates a food when it ETBs, and we can tap it, pay two, and sack a food to have target player lose three life, for some additional food and a means to turn it into burn for extra reach. More ever-growing threats join us in the CMC4 slot with Blood Tracker, Forgotten Ancient, and Fangren for Spawn. Blood Tracker is a 2-2 flyer that we can pay a black into life to put a plus one plus one counter on, as well as allowing us to draw cards equal to the amount of counters on it when it leaves the battlefield, making it a decent evasive body that keeps getting bigger and gives us card advantage no matter how our opponents get rid of it. Forgotten Ancient is a 0-3 that gains a plus one plus one counter anytime anyone casts a spell, then lets us move those counters to other creatures on our upkeep, being somewhat similar to Mana Gorger Hydra with the benefit of gifting its counters to bigger threats to make them even scarier. Fangren Firstborn is a 4-2 that gives all attacking creatures a plus one plus one counter whenever it attacks, providing us with a continual way to pump the team so long as our commander keeps it alive through its first few attacks. At the halfway mark, we're joined by some food support cards with Fierce Witchstalker, Gluttonous Troll, and Wicked Wolf. Fierce Witchstalker is a 4-4 Trampler that creates a food when it ETBs for another form of food generation on a relatively big body. Gluttonous Troll is a 3-3 Trampler that creates a food equal to the amount of opponents we have when it ETBs, and we can pay 1, a green, and sack a non-land permanent to give it plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn, usually netting us 3 or 4 food alongside our commander, and a decent means to pump itself by sacking those tokens or other permanents we no longer need. Wicked Wolf is a 3-3 that fights an opponent's creature when it ETBs, and we can sack a food to put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it to make it indestructible and tap it, making it a decent fight-based removal effect and another ever-growing threat that doesn't need Gyom to protect it. Reaching the end of this slot, we have Storev, Devkar and Lich, King Makar the Gold Cursed, and Beast Whisperer. Storev is a 5-4 Trampler that has us return a creature or Planeswalker from our grave to our hand if it deals combat damage to a player, so long as hit card wasn't put there this combat, ensuring our creatures and Planeswalkers are usable again and again on a well-statted body. King Makar is a 2-3 with Inspire, which allows us to exile a creature and create a gold token we can sack for any one mana whenever he untaps, synergizing perfectly with our commander as we can tap him down without having him to attack for a continual source of exile-based removal and ramp. Beast Whisper is a 2-3 that draws us a card every time we cast a creature, providing us with some staple green card draw to support our creature-heavy playstyle. Proceeding to the CMC5 slot, we have some mass pump effects with Loyal Guardian, Masaryk Crawl Death Priest, and Blossoming Bog Beast. Loyal Guardian is a 4-4 Trampler that, so long as we control our commander, gives all our creatures a plus one plus one counter at the beginning of our combat step, providing us with even more team-wide pump that we can easily keep around thanks to Guillaume. Masaryk is a 2-2 Flyer that also gives all our creatures a plus one plus one counter, but this time when any player sacrifices a permanent, pumping our team further as we crack our food tokens or our opponents crack their baubles or fetches. Blossoming Bog Beast is a 3-3 that gains us 2 life when it attacks, then pumps all our creatures by plus x plus x, x being equal to the amount of life we gain this turn, and grants them trample until the end of the turn, effectively turning each of our food tokens into a board-wide plus 3 plus 3 and providing trample to boot. Some powerful creatures that want to stick around are up next with Vulturous Zombie, Archfiend of Depravity, and Bloodgift Demon. Vulturous Zombie is a 3-3 flyer that gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter anytime an opponent's card goes to the grave from anywhere, adding an evasive and ever-growing threat to the board that gets bigger as our opponents use and lose resources. Archfiend of Depravity is a 5-4 flyer which has each opponent sack all but two of their creatures on each of their end steps, providing us with a continuous board wipe that leaves our board unaffected so long as we keep them around. Bloodgift Demon is another 5-4 flyer that has target player lose a life and draw a card on our upkeep, providing us with a Phyrexian Arena effect on a big evasive body. Reaching the end of this slot, we have Marshland Bloodcaster and Drana the Last Bloodchief. Marshland Bloodcaster is a 3-5 flyer that we can pay 1, a black, and tap to pay life equal to the next creature we cast CMC instead of mana, allowing us to play our bigger creatures while leaving mana up to protect them with our commander. Drana is a 4-4 flyer that, whenever it attacks, has the defending player choose a creature from our graveyard to put it into play with a plus 1 plus 1 counter and making it into a vampire, providing us with a continual means to recur our creatures from the bin and generating additional food alongside our commander. More big threats join us in the CMC6 slot with Demon of Dark Schemes, Necropolis Regent, and Marionette Master. 
Demon of Dark Schemes is a 5-5 flyer that gives all creatures minus 2, minus 2, and it ETBs until end of turn, and generates an energy whenever another creature dies, allowing us to pay 2, a black, and 4 energy to reanimate a creature from any grave under our control tapped, giving us a potent combination of Big Evasive Bonnie, Mini Board Wipe, and Continual Reanimation to keep growing our board. Necropolis Regent is a 6-5 flyer that has creatures gain plus 1 plus 1 counters equal to the amount of damage they deal to a player, making our evasive and trampling threats grow even bigger as they keep dealing damage. Marionette Master is a 1-3 that comes into play with either 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters or 1-1 one, one tokens thanks to Fabricate, and has target opponent lose life equal to its power whenever an artifact we control is sent to the grave, normally giving us a 4-6 that burns our opponents for 4 whenever our food tokens are used up to get even more utility out of them. Last in the slot, we have some green creatures with Ezra Root Channeler and Feasting Troll King. Ezra Root Channeler is a 4-6 with reach that we can tap to gain 2 life and reduces the cost of all our creatures by X, X equaling the amount of life we gain this turn to provide us with a massive cost reduction as we crack our food tokens for life. Feasting Troll King is a 7-6 with Trample and Vigilance that, when it ETBs from our hand, creates 3 food tokens and can be returned from the grave to the field by sacking 3 food during our turn, giving us a huge body that can recur itself alongside a substantial amount of food production. Finally, reaching the CMC 7 slot, we have our last creature with Herald of Anguish, a 5-5 with Improvise and Flying that has our opponents discard a card on each of our end steps, and we can pay 1 a black and sacrifice an artifact to give a creature minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, providing us with yet another evasive beat stick that we can help pay for with our food tokens, which will slowly whittle down our opponent's resources as well as weaponize our food. Now with all our creatures covered, let's move on to our instance. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we have its only two members with Costly Plunder and Golgari Charm. Costly Plunder allows us to sack a creature or artifact to draw two cards, allowing us to turn our food tokens into instant speed card draw. Golgari Charm lets us either have all creatures lose minus one minus one until end of turn, destroy an enchantment, or regenerate all our creatures, giving us a handful of decent effects to deal with a variety of situations. Moving into the CMC3 slot, we have a pair of removal spells with Putrefy and Beast Within. Putrefy allows us to destroy a creature or artifact and it can't be regenerated, giving us a flexible removal spell with occasional upside against regenerators. Beast Within destroys a permanent at the cost of giving its controller a 3-3 token, making it an all-star green removal spell that deals with nearly any type of threat. Finally reaching the CMC4 slot, we have our last trio of instants with Bake Into a Pie, Mortality Spear, and Rampage of the Clans. Bake Into a Pie simply destroys a creature and creates a food token, giving us an overcosted yet effective way to generate food alongside serviceable removal. Mortality Spear destroys target non-land permanent and costs two less if we gain life that turn, serving as another piece of flexible removal that works well with our life gain. Rampage of the Clans destroys all artifacts and enchantments, then gives their controllers a 3-3 token for each, blowing up the back row of everyone and turning our food into 3-3s for an instant board state that will usually be larger than our opponents. That's all our instants covered, so let's move on to our sorceries. Moving straight into the CMC2 slot, we have Farseek, Rampant Growth, and Sign in Blood. Farseek and Rampant Growth both fetch a land for us and put it into play tapped, with the former fetching any swamp and the latter any basic for some no-nonsense land ramp. Sign in Blood has a player draw two cards and lose two life for some efficient black card draw that can burn our opponents in a pinch. The CMC3 slot brings us even more ramp with Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, and Search for Tomorrow. Cultivating Kodama's Reach, both search our deck for two basics, putting one into play tapped and the other into our hand for some more efficient green land ramp. Search for Tomorrow puts only one basic into play from our deck, but it comes into play untapped and has to spend two for a green, being usable even on turn one for some more efficient ramp. Closing out this slot, we have two food generators with Forboding Fruit and Giant Opportunity. Forboding Fruit has target player draw two cards and lose two life, generating a food token for us if we use triple black to pay for it, giving us another copy of Sign in Blood with a food creation upside. Giant Opportunity has us either sack two food to create a 7-7 or create three food, which will usually be playing for the extra food tokens but allows us to turn our food into a body for some more flexibility. Going into the CMC4 slot, we only have two members with Harmonize and Healing Technique. Harmonize simply has us draw three for some straightforward card advantage with no hoops to jump through. Healing Technique lets us return a card from our grave to our hand and heals us equal to its CMC, exiling itself after it resolves. It also lets us create a copy of itself at the cost of giving our opponents another copy as well, for some potent 2 for 1 healing and recursion. Finally, reaching the CMC 6 slot, we have our last two sorceries with Deadly Tempest and Taste of Death. Deadly Tempest destroys all creatures and burns their owners equal to the amount of creatures they lost this way, giving us a board wipe and burn card that we can mitigate most if not all of thanks to Guillaume. Taste of Death has everyone sack three creatures and we create three food, giving us a powerful edict effect to remove troublesome creatures, though we will need to be careful about this one since Guillaume cannot protect us from it. 
That's all our sorceries covered, so let's move on to our enchantments. The CMC 1 slot gives us Font of Fertility, which we can pay 1, a green, and sack to fetch a basic out from our deck and put it into play tapped, for a Wayfarer's Bobble effect in green, which we run for the same reason. The CMC 2 slot has our last two enchantments with Trail of Crumbs and Underhanded Designs. Trail of Crumbs creates a food when it ETBs and allows us to pay 1 when we sack a food, so look at the top two cards of our deck, reveal a permanent from among them, and add it to our hand, sending the rest to the bottom of the deck in a random order, giving us some decent card draw as we use up our food tokens. Underhanded Designs lets us pay 1 when an artifact ETBs to drain the table for 1 and heal for 1, also allowing us to pay 1, a black, and sack it to destroy a creature if we control 2 or more artifacts, again getting us more mileage out of our food and occasionally being removal if required. That's it for our enchantments, so let's move on to the artifacts. It's all single entry slots in this section, starting with the CMC1 Witch's Oven, which lets us sack a creature to create a food, or two food if the sacked creature's toughness was four or greater, giving us a means of generating additional food from creatures we can't or are unwilling to save otherwise. The CMC2 slot gives us Giant Skewer, an equipment that equips for three that grants the equipped creature plus two plus one and creates a food if it deals combat damage to a creature, allowing us to pump our creatures even further and create more food if our opponents decide to block them. Then we have our last artifact in the CMC3 slot with Inspiring Sanctuary, which gives all our non-artifact spells Improvise, effectively turning all our food tokens into mana rocks that tap for one when we cast spells for a huge amount of mana ramp. That's all our artifacts covered, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our only Planeswalker joins us in the CMC6 slot, that being Garrick, Cursed Huntsman, who comes into play with 5 loyalty and has the following 3 loyalty abilities. For 0 loyalty, Garrick creates 2 2 2 tokens that give him a loyalty when they die. For minus 3 loyalty, he destroys a creature and draws a card. And finally, for minus 6 loyalty, we get an emblem that grants all our creatures plus 3 plus 3 and trample. That makes Garrick a Planeswalker which is capable of protecting itself and adding loyalty by creating tokens, serving as serviceable removal and card draw, as well as having a relatively easy to reach ultimate that pumps all our other creatures, all of which synergize well with this deck's playstyle. That's it for our Planeswalker, so let's take a look at our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Lanoir Wastes, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors if we take a damage, Tainted Wood, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors if we control a swamp, Necroblossom Snarl, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal a swamp or forest from our hand and taps for either of our colors, Temple of Malady, which comes into play tapped, Scries 1 when it ETBs and taps for either of our colors, Witherbloom Campus, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and we can pay 4 and tap to Scry 1, Woodland Chasm, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and counts both as a swamp and a forest. Gingerbread Cabin, which counts as a forest, comes into play tapped unless we control three other forests and creates a food token when it comes into play untapped. Blighted Woodland, which taps for a colorless and we can pay three, a green, and tap it and sack it to put two basics from our deck into play tapped. Myriad Landscape, which taps for a colorless, comes into play tapped and we can pay two and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. And finally, Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both which we can tap and sack to put a basic land into play tapped from our deck. For utility lands, we are running Bajuka Bog and Ghost Quarter. Bajuka Bog comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and exiles target opponent's graveyard for some potent graveyard hate in our land slot. Ghost Quarter taps for a colorless, and we can tap it and sack it to destroy target land, giving its controller a basic from their deck to replace it, making it a good source of spot removal for our opponent's utility lands. Lastly, we're running 11 forests and 11 swamps as our basics to fill out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 38 creatures including the Commander, 7 Instants, 12 Sorceries, 3 Enchantments, 3 Artifacts, 1 Planeswalker, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 17 cards that create food tokens, 12 cards that care about food tokens being created or destroyed, 11 cards that get bigger over time, 7 creatures with powerful repeatable effects, and 5 cards that bring creatures back into play or into our hands from the grave, giving us a large selection of food creation effects to work alongside our commander, a variety of ways to get extra utility from said food, powerful ever-growing threats and abilities we can protect with our commander, and ways to bring them back in case they're destroyed. For general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 4 board wipes, giving us a fairly standard array of ramp, draw, and removal with no real outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 6 1 drops, 10 2 drops, 16 3 drops, 15 4 drops, 8 5 drops, 8 6 drops, and 1 7 drop, leaving us with a mid-game curve that allows us to play our powerful creatures and protect them through our commander's ability until they overwhelm our opponent's board states. 
Currently, this deck is valued at 6440, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For some side grades, some food synergies would be a welcome addition. Disciple of the Vault gives us some burn as we sack our food, while Nadir's Nightblade drains the table and heals us instead. Silver Smoke Ghoul is a good addition as well, since it can bring itself back from the grave as we sack our food for life and gives us some card draw by sacking itself. Cards that turn our food tokens into card advantage would be good additions as well, with Keskit the Flesh Sculptor, God Eternal Bantu, and Reprocess all being able to do this, allowing us to get further utility out of our food if we don't need to use it to protect our creatures. For some upgrades, Obnixilus Unshackled is a powerful threat that gets bigger over time and punishes tutoring and fetching. Lord of the Void gives us a powerful evasive body that gives us additional bodies on board as it connects with our opponent's faces. And Archfiend of Despair prevents our opponents from gaining life as well as effectively doubling the amount of damage they take each turn. Finally, Doubling Season will double the amount of food tokens we create and the number of plus one plus one counters we generate while having the exact same opposite effect on the funds we have in our banks if we run it. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for helping this channel reach the 250 sub milestone, as I could have not done this without all of your support. Next, as per the votes in the comments, the next cut rate commander will be featuring Quintorius Field Historian, as voted by Tuarpool, Chris Hogan, Jerry Husso, and Link Maxwell. That means the new lineup will be Zimone Quandrix Prodigy, Rutha Mercurial Artist, and Ruxa Patient Professor. Let me know in the comments below which of these three you would like to see in an upcoming video. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.